My sermon is Fight the Good Fight of Faith. So, um, I wanted to begin by saying, we are called to be like Jesus. Uh, we are all facing problems. I'm sure that there's, no, there's nobody here who's not facing problems. I'm facing problems. We all have issues. And God knows about uh, those issues. Jesus was always there for people who had problems. All kinds of people came to him and he never turned them away. He was always willing to help. And we should be like that. We should be like Jesus. And we need to remember Jesus has the answer to every question. Any questions you have, Jesus has the answer to that question. God knows everything about us. He said the very hairs on your head are numbered. Jesus is called the Heavenly Father. We have the Bible. We have the words of the Lord Jesus. We should be confident. We should stand firm on the promises of God. We should stand on the word of God against all the wiles of the enemy. The uh, text I wanted to speak about today was uh, Matthew chapter 4, verses 1 to 11. I'm sure I don't need to read that text in its entirety. We all know the story. After being baptized, Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. And um, around the world, uh, many Christians are observing the season of Lent at the moment, which is a 40-day period leading up to Easter. So they, they begin on Ash Wednesday. You have Shrove Tuesday when everyone makes pancakes. And then the next day you have Ash Wednesday. And then from Ash Wednesday to Monday Thursday, the day before Good Friday, those 40 days, many Christians observe Lent and they pray and they fast and they prepare themselves for Easter. And I would like to look at the way during this fast, Jesus left an example for us of how we should deal with the devil, how we should face him and his attacks. His attacks. Jesus is our example. He is our great high priest. He has gone before us and shown us the way. He has not only shown us the way, he is the way. He said, I am the way, Amen. the truth, and the life. In the Gospel of John, chapter 14, verse 30, if you want to turn to that um, passage, John 14, 30, I don't know if it's on, the, oh, it's on the screen, yeah. Jesus says, I will no longer talk much with you, for the ruler of the world is coming, and he has nothing in me. Jesus was the spotless Lamb of God. There was no sin in Jesus, and that was why he could pay the price for all our sins. The sinless Son of God died for sinful man. He died for us all so that we might all live in the new life that he gives us. As Brother Steve reminded us last week, there is now no condemnation to those who are in Christ. The work of redemption is finished, and we are cleansed by his blood. This does not mean, however, that we cease to sin or displease God the moment we believe in Jesus. We don't instantly become perfect. In Matthew chapter 26, verse 41, we read how, before his death, when he was praying in the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus told his disciples, watch and pray. This is exactly what Brother Steve just said about praying to be ready when the enemy attacks. Watch and pray, lest you enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. God is doing a work of redemption in our hearts. The moment we repent and turn to Jesus, we are saying to him, Lord, help us. God has a plan for our lives. God wants us to be perfect. He wants us to be like Jesus. 
We are called to be transformed. If we are following the Spirit of God, we should be daily growing in the Lord. We are called to be changed from glory to glory as we look at the image of God, the face of God in Christ Jesus. So God is calling us to be like his son, to be like Jesus, and to follow his example. The next point I want to make is, the devil will hit us, he will attack us at our weak point. Jesus said, the devil comes to me, but he can't find anything in me. But in us, we are not perfect like Jesus. We are not sinless. And the devil knows where he can grab us and swing us around. And um, in Revelation 12, chapter 10, the devil is called the accuser of the brethren. You remember in the story of Job, how he went before God with the, in the midst of the sons of God. And God said, what have you been doing, Job? And he said, I've been wandering around uh, up to and fro. And he said, have you seen my servant Job? And there's none like him. And he started accusing Job. He said, he's the accuser of the brethren. In Revelation 12, 9, we read, So the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was cast to the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. The devil is called the old serpent, the great dragon, the enemy who deceives the whole world. He's also called the God of this world. Paul calls him the God of the world who has blinded the whole world. In the Gospel of John 8:44, when the Jews were arguing with Jesus and they were saying, calling him bad names, and he, Jesus says to them in John 8:44, you belong to your father the devil and you want to carry out your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning and not holding to the truth. For there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native t language. For he is a liar and the father of lies. John 10.10 10 states, the, the, the thief comes, does not come to, except to steal, to kill and destroy. I have come that they might have life and have it more abundantly. We see here that the devil wants to steal, kill, and destroy. He wants to take our happiness. He, wants, he doesn't want to see people happy. He wants to see people suffering and to be in darkness. But Jesus came that we might have life and have it more abundantly. The devil's desire is to spread doubt in the hearts of men and women. He wants to question the word and truth of God. Just like he did in the Garden of Eden. He, he came to Eve and there was only one commandment that they were supposed to keep. That was, don't eat from the tree of knowledge and good and evil. And so he, made, he got them to do that. He tricked them. He said, why does God want you to... He, he, he was, why does God, why does God, did he say that to you? There must be something's not right. God, God can't be, no, something's not right. You should, you should definitely eat that. And he tricked them. So um, his kingdom is, the devil's kingdom is a kingdom of darkness. And he rules through deceit and lies. He is a liar and the father of lies. He is the God of this world who deceives the whole world. He tricked Eve into disobeying God's, disobeying God's command. He sowed the seed, seed of doubt. He asked her, uh, why did, does God have your best interests at heart when he told you not to eat from the tree of knowledge? He mixed truth with lies and led her astray. In a way we can say, that the first sin was the sin of pride. The idea that man is self-sufficient and doesn't need to depend on God. The idea that our own wisdom and knowledge is enough instead of asking what is God saying to us. I truly believe God wants to speak to us every day if only we have ears to hear. 
So who, who are we listening to? We have the, the enemy taunting us and trying to put doubt in our hearts, or are we listening to God and what he is telling us every day? The enemy caused Eve to mistrust God and Adam. Adam and Eve rebelled against God and fell into sin. In exactly the same way the devil is working today in the world, he asks people, does God really exist? How could a, a loving God allow so much suffering in the world? He asks, will God really help you if you pray to him? Does God really care? And then he tells people, you're on your own. Nobody cares about you. The problems you are facing are too great. They're too difficult. You won't be able to solve them. In this way, he spreads seeds of doubt and fear and mistrust in the hearts of men, just as he did in the Garden of Eden. He makes man to turn away from God and to look to anything but Jesus to solve their problems. However, in Matthew chapter 4, verse 1 to 11, we see that the attitude of Jesus and the way that he responded to temptation was different to the way Eve responded. He saw through the deceitfulness of the devil. He realized that the devil did not have his best interests at heart. Jesus used the word of God as a, the sword of the spirit to respond to the devil's evil advice. Jesus was starving. He hadn't eaten anything for 40 days. And the devil came to him and pointed to his weakness and told him, why don't you do something about it? If you are the son of God, command these stones to become bread. Maybe the devil might be tempting you in some way to do something. And he's saying, if you do that, that will solve your problems. But it's not God's way. And he doesn't want you to do that. He wants you to stand on the word of God, on the promises of God, and do what God says in the Bible. But what is the reply of Jesus? It is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. In the same way, the devil will come to us and point to our weaknesses and make fun of us and try to turn us away from trusting in God. We need to hold fast on the word of God and look to Jesus and his salvation on the cross where he said, it is finished. The work has been done. The price has been paid. Whenever the enemy comes and tries to make you feel bad, remind him that the Jesus has paid the price on the cross. And through his death, we are saved by the blood. This is how we can fight against the temptations of the devil by standing firm on the gospel of Christ the new covenant made through the sacrifice of Jesus himself. There's a very famous quotation by a French um, philosopher, French mathematician called Pascal, who lived in the 17th century, many, about 400 years ago, where he says, there is a God-shaped vacuum in the heart of each man which cannot be satisfied by any created thing, but only by God the Creator made known through Jesus Christ. In every human heart, there's a God-shaped vacuum, a shape there. Nothing can fill that vacuum. Only God. Only God the Creator made known through Jesus Christ. We cannot be satisfied unless God fills our hearts by his spirit and we daily live according to his word and will. This is the abundant life Jesus spoke about in John 10.10. 10. When God comes into our hearts, he fills us with joy. He fills even facing suffering. We can laugh in the face of suffering we can laugh in the face of trouble. Jesus, uh, Paul says, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. And when Paul was writing that, he was deep in a Roman dungeon. 
And the Philippians were worried about him because in those days, people were very cruel the way they treated prisoners. It was not like these days, the prisons are, they say the people go there and they don't suffer. But in those days, people really suffered in prisons. And even there, uh, Paul says, rejoice in the Lord always. Uh, this, uh, so we must learn to use the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God, the promises of God, remind ourselves of the commandments of God to fight against the lies and the temptations of the devil. The next point I want to make is that if you don't trub the, trouble the devil, the devil won't trouble you. As long as you, as long as you are leading your good life and not doing anything to hurt him, he will be very happy with you. As soon as you do something that disturbs him, he will come after you. Uh, there's a war going on in the Ukraine and people are being killed. There's fear and panic. The world is waiting to see what this Russian invasion will bring, what kind of outcomes it will bring about on the world stage. However, we also are at war. 2 Corinthians 10 verses 4 to 5 we read, For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God, for pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments, and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. The devil has a kingdom, and the Lord Jesus also has a kingdom. Whose side are you on? Who are you fighting for? If you begin to attack the devil and cause him problems, he, will, he won't take it sitting down. In the life of Jesus, we see how at many times, many different people tried to kill him, but they couldn't because his hour had not yet come. When he was a baby, Herod tried to kill him. After his baptism, when he went to his hometown of Nazareth, the people there tried to kill him because they were just, just jealous. Why does he know all of these things? They just they got jealous. In, Jew, the, in Jerusalem, the Jews tried to stone him to death when he told them before Abraham was, I am. So all through his life, he was, being, he was under threat of being killed. But nobody could kill him. He was the son of God. He said, I lay down my life of my own accord. Amen. He laid down his life for, to save the world. And he said, I have the power to lay it down and I have the power to take it up again. So he knew that he will die and he knew after three days he will rise again. In John 7:7, 7, 7 we read, Jesus says, the world cannot hate you, but it hates me because I testify of it that its works are evil. We are to be set apart and consecrated to God like the priests in the Old Testament. In 2 Corinthians 6.14 we read, Do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness, and what communion has light with darkness? Christians are called the light by St. Paul. We are, the, we are called the body of Christ. Christ is our head. I love it when Paul calls the believers righteousness. In 2 Corinthians uh, 5.21 we read, For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. As Christians in the world, we are to be the light of the world and the righteousness of God. God has called us to reveal Christ through our lives and bring glory to God through our daily works. In John 15, 18, Jesus says, If the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. There is no union between light and darkness. That's why we can sit here, we talk about the Bible, and we feel encouraged and comforted. But if you ask somebody who lives in the world and they have a good life and they won't 
They, it's difficult unless the Spirit of God works in their heart. They can't understand what you're talking about. In John 15, 18, if the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. Jesus never promised that the Christian life would be a bed of roses. In John 16, 33, Jesus says, These things I have spoken to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation. Be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. So as Christians, we are on the winning side. Amen. Jesus is the victor and he has given us power over all the power of the enemy. Let us live daily as victorious children of God who are more than conquerors. So I want to keep this talk quite short, so I'll just finish by telling you a story. So there was um, once a vicar, and he always used to speak for too long, his sermons were too long, and all the congregation were fed up. So um, one day his wife had an idea. She said, I'm going to give you a sweet. She said to him, she said, darling, I'm going to give you a sweet, and just before you start your sermon, put that in your mouth, and then when the sweet is finished, then you, can, you should finish your sermon. So, that was, so he started doing that. So the sermons were about 15 minutes, and everyone was very happy. So, he was, so um, and his wife was happy, everyone was happy, he was happy as well. And then one day, so he started preaching, but he preached for a long time again. And uh, very long, more than usual. So when he got home, he said, uh, his wife said, what happened? I gave you the sweet, and you kept preaching for so long. And he said, oh my dear, that was a, a pebble. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I thought I would end on that story. I don't want to, to give too much of a long talk. Let's pray. Dear Lord Jesus, thank you for all the joy and the love that you put in our hearts to help to stand against all the temptations of the devil. Thank you, Lord, that you are always with us. You're our best friend. And you said, you promised, you will never leave us nor forsake us. Thank you for these, your children, whom you love. And I, I know you have great plans for them. Bless us all. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. amen.